great pleasure to welcome you to this, the first of two sessions in our symposium on faith-inspired organizations and global development. I'm welcoming you on my behalf, but also on behalf of Catherine Marshall, whose uh, brainchild this project is and who has done tremendous work in bringing us together today, and also uh, Catherine, I'm sorry, Carol Lancaster of the Mortara Center, who will be uh, coordinating uh, the second panel earlier this afternoon. Just a little bit of background uh, on this symposium. It's made possible by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation to the Edmund A. Walsh, Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. And the grant, uh, which the Berkeley Center is going to administer, really explores two topics in depth. It's part of a broader project of the Luce Foundation on religion and international affairs. And our two foci here at Georgetown are the religious sources of foreign policy, looking at the United States and broader comparative perspective, and questions of religion and global development. I just mentioned a couple of events. One event some of you uh, attended uh, several weeks ago on evangelicals and foreign policy. Another event coming up April 23rd on religion, migration, and foreign policy. It's part of that first project area, the religious sources of foreign policy. Today, of course, we're focusing on religion and development. And here, with the help of the Luce Grant and under Catherine's uh, leadership, uh, we're doing several things designed to inform the debate uh, in this very important and emergent uh, area. There's a religion and development database you can visit on our website. We're developing religious literacy materials relating different religious traditions to key development issues, uh, materials that might be of interest, we hope, not just to scholars and students, but to people out there uh, in the developing world. Just a couple of words about Catherine Marshall, who I think most of you know. Uh, Catherine joins the Berkeley Center as a senior fellow, joined Georgetown as a visiting professor of government less than a year ago, this last August. Before that, she had a long, distinguished career at the World Bank. And toward the end of that career, uh, from the late 1990s onward, worked very closely with Jim Wolfenson, then president of the bank, to develop this issue area of ethics, religion, and development policy. Since leaving the bank and coming to Georgetown, she's continued to work with the bank, with development professionals, with religious and political and policy leaders within a very dynamic NGO, again, I think known to many of you, the World Phase Development Dialogue, which is now based in part here at Georgetown and at the Berkeley Center. Catherine has published widely in this area, the intersection of faith and development. Um, she's someone who is really at the heart of our efforts at Georgetown, working with partners to develop research agendas, policy agendas at the intersection of these two worlds. I could go on, but let me turn it over to Catherine, who, as I said, really uh, helped to bring today's event about. Catherine, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think I will just uh, start by saying that I'm really pleased to be here thank Tom for his introduction and add my welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I hope that all of you and all of us will be part of a continuing discussion uh, on the issue of how faith-inspired organizations uh, are involved and can be more involved in the development agenda and what kinds of special issues emerge as a result. Uh, in uh, introduction, let me commend to all of you the preparatory materials. Uh, there are copies of them outside the door, but they're also available on the Berkeley Center website. And they consist first of a paper, which is what we would describe as a mapping exercise. Um, three uh, graduate student fellows, uh, one of whom I see, uh, have spent the last months combing uh, the literature and the websites of the extraordinary array of faith-inspired organizations with an effort to distill uh, information about the organizations, but also uh, to trace the lines of the policy debates, uh, particularly in relation to the United States. And secondly, 
uh, in part to avoid the terrible pain <coughs> of preparing papers for the conference, but also to encourage this spirit of interchange uh, and exploration. Uh, I engaged with each of the eight panelists today in an interview process. And those interviews, uh, which I find extraordinarily rich and informative about the issues and the nature of the work, are also posted on the website. So this first panel is again a mapping exercise. So what's going on? What kinds of organizations? Uh, how are they developed? Uh, what is the political environment in the United States, which is clearly uh, this is an issue not only for many people in the development community here, uh, but working overseas. Uh, there's often something approaching bewilderment about how the United States uh, is involved with the broad issues of faith and particularly faith uh, in development. We're also interested in how these issues are evolving and any crystal ball projections that anyone like to offer about how they will be affected by the presidential campaign uh, that is already so well launched uh, and broader issues of foreign policy. So that is the framework of this first session. Uh, we hope um, from these two sessions today to emerge with at least two things. The first is a much clearer research agenda. In other words, one of the gaps in knowledge. Who are the people we should Talking to. Uh, and secondly, a sense of where the major policy challenges and issues are. In other words, uh, what, what needs to be done to frame the policy debate uh, in these areas. Uh, we are going to start with David Beckman, uh, partly because uh, he's been shoehorned out of his extraordinary schedule, and I thank you very much for being willing to be here. And we will end with Hadi Amar, who is in a sense our bridge to the Middle East, because he's working now from the Gulf uh, and has a very broad uh, international background. Uh, so, uh, and then we'll have about two of the extraordinary organizations that are faith-inspired, uh, clearly, and that are deeply involved as operators uh, in the development and widely respected CRS and Habitat. Uh, there are brief bios uh, in the materials that you have, but let me very briefly introduce David Beckman. Uh, David is uh, an extraordinary voice uh, for the poor of the United States and globally. Uh, he uh, has a uh, uh, bread for the world, which is a remarkable organization. Uh, he is, every time I speak to him, I find myself inspired by his hope and optimism uh, that the moral arguments and the practical evidence of possible success have led to a turn in the uh, that the uh, citizens are genuinely uh, moving now in the United States in the direction that I think we would hope as an uh, so, and David's background is also uh, in his interview. Um, uh, Bill O'Keefe uh, is uh, a stalwart uh, leader uh, in cash reporting services. Uh, so he's come from Baltimore uh, and again has a very wide international experience and I think a very savvy appreciation of the issues of the balance between the Catholic ethos and origin of CRS uh, and the practical demands of development on the ground. Uh, Steve Weir uh, has just moved back from living for many years in Asia with Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, we uh, at the Berkeley Center hosted a very interesting exploration that was inspired by Habitat in December, uh, which first highlighted how rarely the issues of housing and shelter figure prominently on the basic agenda. But secondly, it highlighted to us the amazing reach of Habitat, the number that there are one million volunteers a year 
in habitat projects in the United States alone. Uh, has stuck with us. Steve is, is an architect and a very practical person, um, also uh, very thoughtful about the basic development challenges that we all face. And last but not least, Hadi Amar is, uh, I very aptly called me thought leader. Uh, his, uh, the range of his intellectual and political interests is very wide. Uh, he has uh, worked in a number of different organizations. I worked with him most recently in the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders, which is addressing the West Islamic dialogue. So he has the unusual uh, role of sitting very much in the American political system, but with a very keen interest and knowledge uh, and engagement with the Middle East where he is now spending about half of his time. Uh, so as you see, we have an extraordinary group of people. So with that, let's turn to David. I think I will really use the, this mic. Uh, I'm sort of wedged in between here, otherwise. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for inviting me and for, for the Berkeley Center for organizing this uh, project of research. And I apologize that I already had another commitment, so I have to leave at 11 o'clock. We won't be able to hear the whole uh, conference. I want to use my 10 minutes to argue that the math is wrong. The mapping exercise leaves out about two continents. Uh, and the, the continents that it leaves out are what faith-inspired organizations are doing to influence U.S. policy toward global development. The paper says very little about what the what the churches and other religious bodies in this, and religious communities in this country are doing to influence global development policy. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I just thought it would be a good way to get started. I, I, I want to talk first about Bread for the World, my own organization, because the paper doesn't really get Bread for the World. And we're a big part of what the churches are doing on global poverty in terms of advocacy, and then talk about other agencies church, and then finally the churches, and then finally make the point that uh, <coughs> religious advocacy on global poverty is expanding very rapidly right now. So just first I want to talk about Bread for the World. Bread for the World organizes Christians of all stripes to lobby Congress for poor and hungry people in this country and around the world. Uh, we have 60,000 activist members. We connect with 6,000 parishes and congregations. We have support from the Catholic bishops in about 50 Protestant denominations of all stripes. We mobilize several hundred thousand thoughtful constituent communications with members of Congress every year on issues that are important to poor people in our country and worldwide. It's divided roughly half and half between issues that affect poor people here and poor people around the world. Bread for the World is broadly interdenominational, I think, with the exception of Habitat. We're the most broadly interdenominational movement in American church life. Uh, uh, our, the budget of Bread for the World and its affiliates is about $11 million a year. And um, that includes about half of that is 501c4 money. It is money that's explicitly to lobby Congress. Uh, and if you look at the budgets of the various, the many organizations that show up on the Hill trying to say, to speak up for the poor, the global poor, uh, to Congress, I think it's still true that Bread for the World accounts for most of the outright lobbying that's done for the global poor in this country. And it works. Uh, Bread for the World chaired the legislative coalition, the legislative group of the Jubilee Campaign in 1988, 1999, 2000. The Enhanced Tipping Initiative, which has been very effective, as probably 20 million African kids are in school now because of the Jubilee Campaign and the Enhanced Tipping Initiative. It would not have happened without Bread for the World, <clears throat> Christian activists all over the country, uh, recruiting members of Congress one by one. Since 1999, the U.S. government has uh, tripled poverty-focused development assistance. Again, we didn't do that by ourselves. 9-11 helped. President Bush helped. There's a bipartisan 
sense in Congress that we ought to be moving in the direction of doing more for poverty or to reduce poverty around the world. <clears throat> but we wouldn't have seen this big increase <clears throat> in development. <clears throat> <develop> <clears throat> in development assistance without Bread for the World's grassroots uh, network. Uh, this year we're working, Bread for the World is working mainly to reform the U.S. Farm Bill because the way we structure our agriculture isn't good for rural America and it's wreaking havoc in many developing, in the rural areas of many developing countries. And then in terms of the presidential campaign, we're actively uh, lobbying presidential candidates to try to get them to talk about global poverty. And we're doing better, much better than we did in the primary uh, campaigns of four years ago. And this, this issue has come up the agenda, uh, certainly poverty globally and also to some extent poverty in this country. Bread for the World has been uh, helped to found and has been an active partner in the One Campaign. Bread for the World members have been working basically out of church basements and church parlors with no advertising budget for 30 years. And now all of a sudden we've got rock stars in the mega rich helping us. And the One Campaign has been a way of helping to engage all that energy and reach out to tens of millions of Americans far beyond the churches uh, to engage them in global poverty advocacy. So that's bread for the world, but it's not just bread for the world. I just looked through the, the map, uh, and two-thirds of the Christian agencies that are listed there have significant involvements in advocacy. Since about 1980, really it was with structural adjustment that the whole US PBO community started to move into advocacy in a more serious way. Because it was just clear that the policy environment was what it needed to be addressed. And the faith-based PBOs have been in the forefront of that movement into advocacy because in addition to reality, to, to the empirical reality, they've also got to deal with the Bible. And it is clear from the Bible that God cares not only about our personal charity, but about how we organize ourselves as a nation. So Catholic Relief Service has gotten really dynamite advocacy, capacity, church world service, Lutheran world relief. Uh, <laughs> World Vision now is a very serious advocacy partner. Um, so the agencies that are talked about in the paper are more involved in, in advocacy than I think is clear from the paper. And then there's a whole other set of institutions and agencies that come that are faith-inspired organizations that are involved in shaping the U.S. public policy for the development. There are 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 20 church bodies maintain Washington offices to lobby Congress. They're not mentioned. There are big networks and programs in many churches that reach church bodies, that reach out to people with information about what's going on in international development. About five or six of the Protestant denominations have multi-million dollar programs on world hunger, which project information as well as raise money. Those are in the, in the church bodies. Uh, if you read church magazines, the denominational periodicals or uh, other magazines and newspapers that serve the religious community, they're full of information about not just our four, but the DRC and Northern Uganda and development assistance and trade policy. And they're reaching just everyday Americans with information in their homes about uh, international development issues. If you look at the youth education materials, there's a lot. There's also, you might notice, uh, a network, a couple of networks of church-related universities. <laughs> so the Berkeley Center is a faith-inspired organization that is having an impact on global development policy. And it just seems to me the definition of the, the if you're going to draw a map, you've got to draw a bigger map that includes a lot more of what faith communities are doing uh, to affect uh, development policy. The last point I want to make is that this kind of advocacy, public education and then direct efforts to affect U.S. public policy on global development, is expanding pretty dramatically. Uh, Breath of the World has worked with evangelical and Pentecostal churches for since its beginning in 1974, but suddenly, over the last, I'd say about two years ago, maybe four years ago, doors started opening for Bread for the World in evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Uh, 
they get that poverty is as important to God as evangelism. And increasingly, they get that we're not going to make serious pro progress against poverty in our country or worldwide unless we can get stronger leadership from the U.S. government. Um, so uh, certainly groups like the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, the Evangelical Covenant Church, the Christian Reform Church, uh, those denominations have been in the lead. Uh, Rick Warren, uh, Rick Warren, a couple of the big megachurch networks have really shifted and have, have kind of undergone a conversion experience in terms of understanding that public policy is important, understanding that global poverty is important to God, and that public policy is part of what we need to do. We've also been really struck by the increased interest in global poverty among uh, Jewish and Muslim groups, and especially global poverty advocacy. So um, we now have some, some of the money that we're getting from the Gates Foundation, a little of that we're giving to uh, Muslim, we're a Christian organization, but we're working with Mazon, the Jewish response to hunger. They connect with all four movements of American Judaism, and we're, we're talking with Muslims who are not as well organized yet. And how do they want to organize themselves for advocacy on the global problem? But when we do interfaith events, the leadership of the U.S. Muslim organizations is knocking down the door to be part of interfaith leadership on global poverty, public policy issues. Uh, on June 11th, uh, the rest of the world is helping to pull together uh, an interfaith convocation on hunger and poverty at the National Cathedral. I am sure we're going to have uh, more than 50 of the nation's top religious leaders. The leaders of, I would guess, will have three of the four Jewish groups that Orthodox can't come to a convocation in a Christian uh, church. But they'll be there in spirit. We'll have lots of Muslim leadership, Sikhs and Native Americans and Hindus and Buddhists, uh, and Christians all the way from the Southern Baptist Convention uh, uh, we put on the other end of the spectrum, the United Church of Christ. So I just think, you know, if you're doing a mapping exercise, part of the map, a bigger part of the map has to be about what faith-inspired organizations are doing to influence uh, U.S. and global policy on global development issues. Okay, before you sit down, I ask you, since you're going to run off, sure. uh, how do you see the technology revolution? Well, it's uh, it's making it's a huge it's it's the technology is is a huge part of of um, of global poverty advocacy. Um, one thing that's just really clear is the is the sudden prominence of uh, e advocacy move on in our field, the one campaign, um, SojoNet um, is another uh, popular connector, people connecting on the web to some of these issues. Um, Congress, I think, uh, uh, communications with the average member of Congress have probably I don't have a number in my head, but we know it's something like they're getting twice as many communications as they were 10 years ago. <clears throat> so, and, and most of that increase has been a flood of emails. Much of it's sort of junk. Um, but that's an environment which has changed how Congress communicates. Congress is really, members of Congress are really struggling to figure out how to, how to respond to all that uh, new kind of engagement. Um, it's also just created an environment in which people think, oh, we're going to connect, we're going to connect with Congress, you know, what do I think? And that's sort of the environment in which, in fact, that's not a very effective way to move public policy by itself. But, you know, people's assumption is, oh, I know how to do that, and I just click. So, um, and then just, you know, basically a lot of moving legislation is getting information out to people good, timely information so that they can communicate in a thoughtful and effective way with their representatives in Congress. So using the web and using email and using uh, 
technology to get information out, but then helping people connect back to members of Congress in a way that's really going to move the, the, the bill. That's, that's a big challenge. Also then, the global uh, connectivity is just stunning. Uh, I don't think that, we really haven't developed that yet, but that's come up. You know, when I worked at the World Bank, uh, for a while I was in charge of the bank's relationships with environmental NGOs. That's before the World Bank got cuddly with environmental NGOs. And that, in fact, was one of the first times that global uh, that, that a global network used technology and the ease of transportation to uh, for for advocacy. So you had the Environmental Defense Fund and Sierra Club and a few other groups here connected with advocates <coughs> next to the Narmada Dam and next to Rondon in Rondonia and Brazil and in Indonesia with the Transmigration Project. And they were communicating each other probably back then, 15 years ago, it was faxes more than email. But they were in touch. So you had the World Bank coming in sort of with, you know, these missions that would go out and talk to people in Delhi, and then they would get reports from near the Narmada Dam, or they'd go out for a week. And, and then you had an alternate source of information coming in from grassroots groups connected technologically. And just repeatedly, the bank didn't know what was going on. And so the US Treasury finally learned to trust the environmental groups more than the World Bank. And a lot of that was because the um, because technology and easy communication had made it possible for grassroots groups to stay in touch. Or when we were working on follow-up to the when the Enhanced Civic Initiative was just getting started, we had a partnership with the Jubilee Group in Zambia. When the bank and the fund first put forward um, a proposal for the reduction of debt for Zambia. Although the debt service payments were reduced from what they would have been if there hadn't been the program, the debt service payments were going up. You know, so the Zambian, this is the name of the Catholic Church, the Henry was very active in, in that network and in Zambia. And so they would say, this, what? This is Jubilee? Our debt service payments are going up? You know, and it just happened that that thing came to a head. We were able to contact the Treasury. We were able to go see the President of the World Bank. I've been in meetings with presidents of the World Bank, where you know, sort of two days beforehand, I realized I've got a meeting with with the President of the World Bank, and I can you know send an email to somebody in Bolivia to say, how does this look to you? So I go into a meeting with real time information. So that whole capacity, within 10 years, we're going to be in a position where people who care about Darfur or people who care already it's happening. People who care about Northern Uganda are going to be wired up with people in northern Uganda. So let's say if you're in the state that is represented by the chair of the Africa Committee of the, of the U.S. Senate, of the Africa Subcommittee, the Foreign Relations Committee of the U.S. Senate, you could, I don't think we're quite there yet, but you can organize people from that state to really follow what's going on in northern Uganda and be in touch with people there and provide real-time information to your senator you know, as the world gets wired so that you have these multiple connections between people of goodwill in poor countries and people of goodwill in this country there's that kind of advocacy is going to i think uh, very powerfully uh, improve the responsiveness of the u.s government to poor people around the world thank you Uh, good morning. Is this working? Good morning. Yeah. Um, my name is Bill O'Keefe. I'm with the Catholic Relief Services. I direct our advocacy program there. I've been there for 20 years, though. We've worked in Africa and have uh, been able to have broad experience of CRS as a big based organization working in development. Um, thank you, Catherine, and thank you to Berkeley Center and Georgetown and Berkeley for uh, including us in this panel to get on with our share our views. I thought what I'd do is talk briefly about the particular nature uh, and connection of faith through Catholic Relief Services and what that means in terms of what we actually do on the ground in development. Second of all, um, talk a little bit about the political environment and uh, how we see the, the uh, environment vis-a-vis uh, the role of faith-based organizations. 
then make a few uh, suggestions about uh, research agenda that um, people might be interested in exploring further, and then just uh, one or two concluding comments. Um, so we, we hear you well, but I think your microphone is still not on. I think it would be much better. Okay. But just checking whether the microphone is on. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Okay. You know, you never know how close every microphone is here. You never know how close you're supposed to say. Anyway. Um, I mean, CRS is, of course, situated in the particular faith-based reality of the Catholic Church. And there's several obvious things, um, and maybe some not obvious about that. First is, the Catholic Church has a certain hierarchical nature, a certain hierarchical structure. Um, the advantage of that is, it has breath. There is a Catholic presence in almost every country around the world, in one form or another, and to the farthest, most remote places. And we benefit from being able to work through that infrastructure. It also has, it also has depth, which is to say it has a local presence, it has a national presence in every country around the world, a national organization of bishops, and a national organization of social development. Um, and it has a global presence, a global uh, organizations and global networks. So there are things about being a Catholic faith-based organization that perhaps are a little bit different. Um, the, um, the other thing about being a Catholic organization besides the hierarchical nature and structure is the fact that it has a body of social teaching that is documented, that is deep, that is comprehensive, and um, that guides our work and the work of much of what the Catholic Church is up to in this field. Um, and that is a real advantage. We have a bedrock of foundation that our work is based on. Now, the history of CRS in terms of development is really could be characterized as a long reflection on Catholic social teaching and uh, the, the questions of poverty and injustice. And as CRS uh, moved from being simply a relief organization in Europe after the Second World War till the current period, our programming has gotten deeper and deeper as we've reflected on the responsibilities to address root causes of social injustice where we find them. And um, the consequence of that is I think we have a very broad, uh, uh, I mean a very deep approach right now as a faith-based organization where we're meeting basic needs in the field. We're trying to empower people locally to advocate for their own rights and their own um, uh, their own capacities on the ground, and we are conducting advocacy to change U.S. public policy in order to address the U.S. contribution to the problems we face around the world. And finally, as a responsibility to the, uh, the Catholics in the United States, who we represent around the world in a very real way, we are trying to build a sense of solidarity and engagement uh, among the Catholic population in the U.S. In terms of our um, uh, uh, policy work, or, or in terms of, of, therefore, the credibility that CRS has around the world and in the U.S. in our policy work, let me just say a couple quick things. CRS is not a proselytizing organization. And another particular uh, characteristic of the Catholic Church is it's big enough that we have a division of labor. Um, there's an organization in the Vatican called the Propagation of the Faith. And their job and the job of uh, missionary work is in part to uh, evangelize. And the job of CRS, that's not in our job description. We have a different job description given to us by the church. And that job description is to uh, uh, tackle poverty and to uh, address social injustice. So um, we don't do any proselytizing, and I think that's really important for our effectiveness. What we've seen, because we uh, sincerely and um, uh, effectively have, uh, don't participate in any evangelizing or proselytizing, we are able to reach into diverse communities and play a very important role. Um, we are able to build trust in places with large non-Catholic populations. I was in Pakistan a year ago looking at our earthquake relief projects there and was struck by the fact that we um, had 
established our credibility as an organization that was concerned about the needs of the people and not whether or not they had a particular religious faith, how that had built a sense of trust, which allowed us to um, build housing for over 70,000 families and to create um, really an a incredibly effective reconstruction program. The second thing, our credibility in the United States, I think, we have three sources. Um, the first is just our uh, field presence and our expertise and our experience around the world. That doesn't necessarily come as being a faith-based organization, although, of course, there are elements to it. The second source of credibility is the extent to which we represent the moral teaching authority and the hierarchy of the bishops in the United States, and the particular weight that that has as a very large community of people, many of whom happen to be voters. And finally, the extent to which we can engage our own constituency of 65 million Catholics or so and get them to participate in the political process as David uh, so eloquently described, uh, which is really growing, is a source of great credibility in accomplishing advocacy. So those are some things about the particular nature of CRS and how as a faith-based organization we relate to the world. Um, in terms of the current political environment, you know, there has been a huge amount of effort by the current administration to engage faith-based organizations. And I am going to um, propose that that effort was not really intended for groups like CRS. And I say that because we have been uh, receiving government assistance since 1943. Um, we were a large implementer of the Marshall Plan in Europe. We um, have continued to receive government assistance to do uh, the work that we do, and we believe very strongly uh, that the government has a critical role in supporting faith-based organizations like, like CRS. We've always had a Chinese wall, a very high one, uh, with, with, with razor wire along the top dividing our, our work and then the proselytizing the evangelization work, whatever else goes on in the Catholic Church. So that faith-based initiative approach of this administration has had no uh, perceptible effect on us. It doesn't benefit us, it doesn't hurt us, it wasn't intended for us, and so that's the first point. Um, in terms of um, how that's going to play out in the future, though, I am concerned about a backlash, potential backlash, uh, and a very unconstructive backlash politically if there is uh, a change in political tide and those who feel that the faith-based organizations have uh, benefited too much in an unfair or uh, discriminatory way from this uh, current administration, that, that there will be a backlash against faith-based organizations and the funding of faith-based organizations. I think that would be a total disaster um, for several reasons. First of all, uh, the obvious that less good work would be accomplished and less good work would be funded. More importantly, I think that um, uh, this, the problem of global poverty and injustice is much bigger than the faith-based organizations and secular organizations. We need to be focusing on find, working together on these problems and not in some sort of international warfare. Um, let me just talk uh, uh, directly and pointedly about the policy issues around uh, HIV and AIDS and global health. Um, CRS has a uh, very large uh, HIV AIDS uh, initiative. We have 25% of our budget, I think it's now 22% of the $500 million or so that we spend every year is dedicated towards HIV and AIDS. We play a very large role in care and treatment of people with AIDS, in um, palliative care, in uh, antiretroviral medications, in antiretroviral therapy, and meeting the needs of orphans and vulnerable children and addressing stigma and a range of other things. As a part of the Catholic Church, we um, do not promote or advocate for um, condoms as part of an HIV and AIDS strategy. Uh, and we feel we, uh, but we provide complete and accurate information as a matter of policy about, uh, about condoms and what they do, but we do not promote them and we're not going to promote them. Our concern is that um, 
the current legislation, which has a earmark for uh, or designation for abstinence within the funding of prevention in HIV and AIDS, if that goes away, then groups like CRS uh, will not be able to do the sort of programming that we do, which is very much needed. And I'll tell you why that's important. One of the saddest moments in my experience with CRS was uh, walking down the street in Dar es Salaam in 1988 in Tanzania. I was writing a HIV and AIDS strategy for CRS in uh, East Africa, and I bumped into USAID's health officer there, and I said, oh, I want to get with you. I'm putting together the strategy. We're looking at Northwest Tanzania and the serious AIDS problem and the role of the church there, and I'd really like to find out what you're doing. And she said, I don't see any point in being. We're funding condoms. You're not going to do them. Why should we talk? Now, that was perhaps the most short-sighted and ill-informed uh, position that I've ever heard. And it left me, and then she walked away. And I left, I was absolutely for it. Um, we have a very critical role to play. We want to be able to play that role. And I'm afraid that if there is a backlash or pushback that is not constructive, Groups like ours that are doing great work will not be able to continue doing that. Um, the tone is changing in Washington. I was in a series of meetings with House leadership uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, was told that in terms of the budget the, uh, for foreign assistance, it's no longer acceptable to stand up on the House floor and rail about um, foreign assistance, foreign aid, and blah, 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 blah. And that now, for many members, this is a priority. Our goal is to make it a top priority. It's not there yet. But the faith organizations, and I really credit David and Red for the World, and groups like Habitat and really all of us uh, who have been working together on this, have are a major part of that tie. Um, and I think the presidential campaign, uh, their hope that um, parties, people on both sides of the political spectrum, will see uh, the role of faith-based organizations in a balanced way. Um, I'm probably over my time, and so I think what I'll do is just finish up by saying that um, David is right that the engagement of faith-based organizations and the broad range of faith organizations is working and is critical to changing US policy. There are some research things that I think are worth, worth looking into. The, um, the first is, I think, the differentiation between all the elements of faith-based organizations is really critical and needs more definition. Not for the purposes of dividing, but for the purposes of um, developing a more sophisticated understanding out there about what the role of faith-based organizations is in development. Um, when people in our staff refer to FBOs, uh, they're using a very blunt instrument. That means enormous number of things, and I think it's frequently used in one way out of context and another way out of context, and that needs further precision. On the Catholic front, a range of missionary organizations, Jesuits, Mary Knowles, uh, many other organizations that have an American presence or are American-inspired but are obviously faith-based uh, play a huge role in development and in public policy. Catholic health care, there are many links and increasing links between Catholic hospitals, the major hospital chains that are um, connected with the Catholic Church, Catholic universities, uh, increasing links between those Catholic organizations and groups like CRS and our work overseas, but also with many other efforts. So the networking within the Catholic world is really um, growing into hyperspace. Um, and the last research topic would be the nature of coordination and of collaboration uh, that, uh, that goes on both in the American and international environment. And I think this gets to the technological uh, question that Catherine asked David. Um, there is so much more networking and working together uh, of a whole range of different organizations and people in the various different faith communities. The technology has helped to break down some of the denominational barriers, um, and which I think is, to, whenever there's this kind of email instant technology, it tends to undermine hierarchy. And an advantage of that is you 
you have, uh, I was at an archdiocesan social justice gathering in Portland, Oregon on Saturday, and it's organized by the Catholic Church. They are connecting with Bread for the World Network, they're connecting with all Mercy Corps, they're connecting with other groups, they're connecting with CRS, and they can do all that with great ease because they just click on the website, bing, and if they see something that's of interest to them, they do it. Where before, they would have gotten all their information in a vertical way. Thank you very much, and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Let's turn directly to Steve. Well, thank you also for inviting Evan Head to this forum. It's a great opportunity for us to learn more and share about what we're doing. I'm going to stand up and take a slightly different turn. I've been in Asia since 1993, so I am not so familiar with Beltway politics. I'd like to talk a little bit more about potential research things and maybe how some of the policies that are happening here are read and understood and maybe halfway around the world. I would just briefly say that Habitat for Humanity, for those of you that don't know, is an international organization involved with housing, the eradication of property housing. It's actually kind of interesting. So CRS is very clear where CRS is, very clear where Bread for the World is. We actually do focus surveys uh, nearly every year, and without without fail, each time they come back, people believe that we're a local, secular charity, um, overwhelmingly when we do these focus groups. In reality, we're an international, faith-based development organization. So on the way, in a way, that's a good thing, because we've always considered Habitat to be a big tent ministry. So you don't have to be any particular religion. There's no faith test. So everyone is welcome, and our objective really is to turn the Saturday volunteers into advocates for po poverty eradication of housing. So just with that brief introduction, I'd like to just jump into some research things, and maybe I'll circle back to policy. Uh, I would say one of the things that's most interesting to me in the field, in terms of working with both secular and faith-based organizations, is trying to understand whether we have the same agenda. So if you were to look at a CRS project, or a Habitat project, or a CARE project, or a local uh, NGO project, would the outputs look similar? I would say probably yes. If there's a relief effort, if you build houses, CRS builds houses, you can knock on the walls of the houses. But is the outcome the same? So for faith-based organizations, are we working in a way that 10 years from now, those communities are different in any way? The lives of the individuals with whom we work, because of the way we work, does that change? Is there any transformation that happens? Are those communities more sustainable because faith-based organizations have been a part of that community transformation process, community engagement process? And I would say if they haven't, I would challenge whether we're re really meeting holistically the objectives that each one of our organizations has. I, I wrote briefly in the interview about how I think you could actually measure, measure that. You could measure whether people recognize, replicate, whether we articulate clearly, and whether there's a clear transformation. So the, I would be happy to answer questions later about that. But I think if we can't do that, I would question whether we're really living up to our objectives. Second, and that would be an interesting research project to do a longitudinal study, are the communities in the effect? Another study would be interesting to me is to look at interfaith as a development strategy for peace and reconciliation. So much of what we do in Habitat, housing is an output, but the outcome is really peace and reconciliation. So we have many programs. We have peace fields in the Philippines. We have peace villages where Muslims and Christians come together, and the leaders in both of those communities have agreed that if both of those communities come together and work on houses in that community, that both sides will keep their militia out of that community. And so far, we've had that program for nearly 10 years now, and so far that's been true. So we have a number of peace villages where people from different faiths have worked together and are living together in interreligious harmony in Belfast. While we build houses, really the purpose was to bring Catholics and Protestants together. It's interesting, the original idea was that we would have Catholics and Protestants living together in the same community. That's turned out to be such a challenge that they had to begin by just having Catholics and Protestants working together in each other's communities. Uh, so can development be organized in a way that prevents the ghettoization of religions? And I think 
think that a lot of times we have to question as faith-based organizations, are we working in a non-discriminatory way, in a way that encourages reconciliation between groups, or do we inadvertently uh, favor a particular group or organize the development through a local CBO in a way that actually pushes Christians into Christian ghettos, Hindus into Hindu ghettos, are we actually, by the way we do development, promoting or hindering uh, interreligious peace and reconciliation? So that would be an interesting project if there was interest. Another, I would say, um, would be it's interesting living in Asia, because Asia is a fairly moderate place by most religious standards in terms of activism and conservatism. But I will say that that's changed dramatically in the last five or six years. It's a very different place than it was when I moved there in 93. And it would be interesting to do a study that says <coughs> how conservative, the conservative portions of different faiths leads to fundamentalism and how that leads to inter-religious uh, interactions. So is there some sort of thread where the conservative portion of particular regions, whether it's a Protestant, Catholic, Hindu, Muslim, does that change in some fundamental <coughs> way the way that those those religious groups actually interact with each other? I have some ideas about that that would be interesting to study that. Another uh, thing that would be interesting to me, I wrote a paper recently about human about housing as a transfer of information on agent and human rights. So the question would be as faith-based organizations it's easy to pile on the human rights agenda. We can talk about a rights-based approach. We need the donor agencies to ask for us to include rights-based language in the proposals that we submit. But I would ask, do we, is there a broader agenda as a faith-based organization? Where do those human rights tenets come from? Do we see those human rights within a broader context of our own faith perspective? And when we talk about development in a local context, you know, I've been to Habitat's in, we have 3,000 affiliated organizations. We probably work in 30 or 40,000 villages at any given time around the world. And I've seen a lot of a dollar a day or less families move into a house, their lives totally transformed. I've uh, yet to hear one person talk about what a benefit that was from a rights-based approach. They always talk about what a transformation that was made in their family. And how glad they were to have someone from whatever the development organization is into that community and care about them as human beings from a justice perspective because they've been discriminated against for generations and generations. When I first moved to Sri Lanka, we worked for a family. It was a Hindu family who had been moved from Tamil Nadu to Sri Lanka. And they worked on the Tia Estates. And I don't know if you've been to the Tia Estates in Sri Lanka, but they're really like indentured servitude. They're small, what I would call cattle stalls, or pig size. And the people who work on the estates live in these tiny little, probably five foot wide by 12 foot long houses. That's the entire house. They, sh they share a toilet and water, probably 30 or 40 families for one, one sanitation uh, connection. And the T estates were working with us and trying to provide housing. Well, one of the, once you leave the T estates, once one member of your family leaves the T estates, you're not eligible for T estate housing serious discrimination. And one of those families uh, that we worked with, Mr. Damaraj, his great-grandfather had moved from India, worked in the Kia States, and over generations, they saved enough money to buy a personal land that was probably just about the size of the stage here. But for two generations, they had not saved enough money to build a house. He was Hindu, and he was a teacher. He was, as a teacher, he was qualified for government assistance. They turned him down because he um, he went to a number of the organizations at the temple who normally would have helped with Hindus, but again, because he was low caste, he was prioritized at the bottom of this. For every place that he went that he went, that he should have received assistance, he was turned down. And I'll never forget when we opened, when we handed him the key to that house, he said, you know, all of my life, and for the lives of my families, we've been a family with no address. Oh, that's very profound. You know, somebody didn't have a permanent address. He said, We've been a family with a permanent, without a permanent address. And then he said something that really stuck with me. He said, To be a family without a permanent address in Sri Lanka, what that means is when I see abuse 
in the school district, I can't report because I would immediately be transferred to a, a difficult place in the island. When I see corruption in the government, I can't report that because my family would be moved to a different part of the country and put in harm's way. But now we have this house, we have a permanent address, so no matter what happens, I can stand up with confidence and know that my family can now stay in this place. And so for me, what a profound impact on human rights that has. The development agenda very much is about human rights, but I wonder if as a faith-based organization, do we articulate from a faith perspective how the human rights agenda fits within the broader faith perspective that we each bring? And my suspicion is that each of the faiths represented in this room today, that there would be more overlap in that faith story uh, than there would be disagreement in terms of our purpose and core. So that would be an interesting, an interesting thing to research. How does faith-based development impact human rights? Um, maybe just switching to policy very quickly. Habitat is probably more known for people coming out on a Saturday and swinging a hammer than we are for advocacy. And I would say we've been fairly active in local regulatory framework advocacy. And we've been active on a national level more in capacity building than we have in overall property reduction. Really only in the last few years have we become more active in global poverty reduction, trying to link housing as an important factor. Back this week, I think we have a couple people, people, a couple hundred people here in Washington doing advocacy training. And they'll visit their local legislatures, kind of make an impact for legislation around around housing. So we do we are involved in in advocacy, but I think we're more known for volunteers than we are for advocacy. And it's interesting if you look at some of the policy issues. Uh, I would say that the policy in terms of the faith-based funding abroad. My observation would be that there is some concern, at least in Asia, that that faith-based funding comes with a lot of strings and another agenda. So there is a sense that there is a manifest destiny to faith-based funding of international organizations. So that, that, that's, that was not a concern that I heard before when the government funded CRS and other, and other groups and special projects with a particular focus and naming and faith-based funding, there's a nervousness abroad that, that we, we didn't see. I would also say that uh, another area for, that where there's policy implications is the way that we do relief. So most organizations, there's a relief department and a development department. And you look at the policy, the way relief aid is given out, it must be spent within a certain amount of period and it's limited to the spending on certain areas. And so often there's almost like a different company or a different NGO will come in and there's not really a continuum, there's not a relief to develop a continuum. And it's kind of interesting, after the tsunami, I was in Sri Lanka, I happened to be in Sri Lanka before the tsunami. I actually canceled my reservation so the day before I could tell the swept away and it's a sobering experience. But I remember having very uh, well-known global faith-based organization come to Habitat and say, we have a half a million dollars that we need for you to spend by December. And we said, great, but we can, and we, we can spend that at five or six thousand dollars a family. And we said, well, that's very fine, but you know, I think we can actually build that for more like fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a family. We can help two to three times as many families as you're asking us to help. And they said, well, that's fine, but you know, we really want to spend it all by December. We said, well, we can, if you take the amount of money you have to spend, like what you have to spend per family, we can help that many families by December. There's no local infrastructure, there's no community. People are still looking for their family at swept away. You just can't jump in and start, start building permanent housing. We said, well, can we just spend more on each house? But no, we can't just spend more on each house. We actually turned down that grant. It just seemed uh, morally not appropriate for us to spend more on each house so that a relief organization could demonstrate that they were responsive by spending all the donors' money within a limited amount of time. So I would say there's a, there are policy implications to the way we do relief and development that would bear some advocacy and research in this country. And that would be true. 
you left us in the U.S. that we need you with the need of every international partner. I believe you work in 30 countries in Asia, and in most of those countries, there was a very favorable opinion toward American citizens. There was some concern, less favorable to me about the government. That's dramatically changed now, where there is some concern about American citizens, and significant concern about the U.S. government in most of the countries where we work. 9-11, where our kids went to an international school, bus went through uh, a slum area, and they put a big banner to Osama bin Laden up in the, over the road. And of course, in Thai culture, that came down because that was appropriate Thai culture. But uh, it's gotten much more difficult. There's much more activism, particularly amongst the poor, particularly amongst the poor in religious ghettos, concern about American involvement. So if I go into but, um, a slum area anywhere in Asia now, you might be made in the You do have to be very careful about the way you introduce your program. And I, I would just go to this story. It's interesting, there's a theologian uh, in Sri Lanka who wrote a commentary on one of the Testament books. He said his whole life growing up, he was a but Christian. And it's very interesting. I said, what does that mean? So that means that I would go into the government and I would explain this HIV program, the child prostitution program, and I would say, and he would say, we're a Christian organization, but we don't proselytize. We're a Christian organization, but we work with Buddhist organizations. And he was reading through Paul's writings and he was really challenged to be an and Christian. And I really stuck with him. He said, I read and I just felt like Paul was convicted about saying, I'm a Christian, we're a Christian organization, and because of that, we do these things. And so he said he was praying about it. And the next day he had a meeting with the minister of uh, uh, social welfare. So he went into the meeting, and the minister happened to be a Muslim. In Sri Lanka, there is usually a few seats uh, assigned to the Muslim constituency. So he went in and he explained his child prostitution program on the beach. And the minister said, it sounds like a great program. Now, you're with a Christian organization, aren't you? And he had this big lump in his throat, this very small he said, well, yes, and because of that, we think God created everyone equally, and that there's no reason that children should be excluded from that. And we work with, because we believe people are created equally, we believe that we should work together as faith communities to stamp out child prostitution. And then she said, I believe in that, too. He said, I, I want to work with you. That's exactly what we believe also. I think it was a very interesting lesson, he said, because what happened was, as he began to describe himself as an and Christian rather than a but Christian, there was more transparency. People felt like he was being more honest, being honest. When he was a but Christian, there was always, well, what is the agenda? What's the hidden agenda that you're not telling me? When you're an and Christian, it's very clear. Here's my agenda. We want to work with you. We want to accomplish these things. And so I would just sort of challenge us as a faith-based community to be and Christian or and Buddhist or and Muslim. And I think with clarity and transparency, we can work together in a way that will really dramatically change poverty around the world. Let's go straight to Hadi. Um, thank you, Catherine. And uh, is this working? Is it working? Okay. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Catherine Mark for providing the Berkeley Center. Uh, I had the pleasure to work way under Catherine Marshall at the beginning of my career when I was an intern at the World Bank. Um, heading up the Division of the Sahel. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with her also with the World Economic Forum in the past year. Um, I'm now working uh, as a director of the public institutions, uh, one of the first two centers overseas, uh, in, which is in Doha, the other one in Beijing. Um, before I start, I want to just get a sense of the audience and ask a really quick, a couple of really good questions. How many of you, if it's okay, how many of you have uh, sort of lived in have worked outside the U.S. on any, any issue. Okay, well, so most people here have done that. Um, so then I want to ask a, a, a couple of questions. How many have done that in a predominantly uh, Christian country? And how many have done that in a predominantly Muslim country? Okay, and how many have done that in a, another country? That's actually pretty much what's going on. Um, what what um, I, I, I'd like to offer a few um, remarks, um, and, and, and 
I, I'd really like to build on some of the remarks that were just made um, about public opinion, um, about being an Christian or an Muslim, um, and, and also about how um, working together on projects can, can build more than a house, but it can build, build social transformation. Um, I grew up not far from here in Northern Virginia, but also in Saudi Arabia, <coughs> Iran, and Lebanon, and keep growing up. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, that always inspired me as a person growing up was that was an example or examples of people that worked for social change. Um, and for me, development is really just a, is part and parcel of, of, of social change. So the examples of people who worked for social change um, that built on their faith to do so. And when I look both at the US um, and at the Middle East, the people that, it, I mean, it, it didn't occur to me until much later in my adulthood, but the people that inspired me the most were people that built on their faith to inspire social change. And I, I remember being in like sixth grade and being asked, you know, my teacher to write, uh, you know, like whatever, you know, on a pencil, on one piece of paper, you know, a, a little paragraph on the American that inspired me most, and that was Martin Luther King. I, you know, I remember writing about that, and I, and I remember, you know, I also remember in my summers in Lebanon as a kid, you know, talking to my family, relatives, and relatives there about, you know, the leaders that inspired them. It was all, there was, there was always somebody that that sort of did their work through faith, um, and even if even if I wasn't particularly religious as a sixth grader or as a twenty year old or as a thirty, you know, that it, it's something that, that later in life I've come to realize, and I, I say that because. We in America have a particular opportunity, um, being such a diverse nation, um, which is that I think we have an opportunity to find ways of people to work together, and this is really important, because of their faith, not, well, it's on the side, you know, that, that, that the extent to which we can work together because of our faith. Um, really gives us an opportunity to not only inspire each other, but really be that sort of shining light on the hill that America has always driven and wanted itself to be. That we could be a place where, because we are Catholic, Protestant, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, um, we have things that we want to work on, like poverty, like the environment, um, like so many other issues, and I, so I, I really feel that that is um, some that is a tremendous opportunity that we have to inspire each other and also to sort of go forward into the world. Um, the, the, the second point I wanted to to make is that at least okay, I, I turned forty over the weekend, um, and so when I look back, I may be younger than. Me, you know, but when I look back in my studies in, in economics in the 80s and in college, and, um, the early 90s and in graduate school, I didn't see a lot of acknowledgement of faith in the study of development or even in the study of social change or even in American history. Uh, but it's so there. It's, it's just it's an intrinsic part of everything America has been um, from the 1700s and 1800s and all of the religious movements that, has, that has sprung up in this nation, um, it's always been there. And I think, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice um, to have this strict firewall between faith and government. And, 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 and it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, uh, uh, this is not, I mean, on the one extreme, you can say, well, we will have 10 seats in Congress. Catholics and tendencies and kind of Protestants and that's that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is acknowledging in, in the policymaking process at the National Security Council, at the State Department, and USAID that faith plays a role in how people think, feel, and act both in this country and outside this country. And we ought to do a better job in thinking and analyzing with input from faith communities. That's just what I I, I think I think that our government leadership ought to be doing that. Uh, to some extent. Um, 
much time, good? Um, another remark I, I, I wanted to make is that you know, there are, as I think was just alluded to, there are several areas where people of different faiths can and should work together because of their views. And, and in those areas are the environment, poverty, reproductive health, water, microfinance, and I think those are all important issues. I think in addition to that, building on the comments that were just made about public opinion polling, um, it, it, it is, I think, also valuable, at least on a global dialogue perspective, as Americans, um, for faith-based communities to confront the issues that seem to divide America from the rest of the world, which has a lot to do with our foreign policy these days. And, and, and that faith-based communities can, can play a significant role in that, whether it's about the US role in the war in Iraq, um, or other things that faith-based communities can and should be um, addressing those things. Um, I, I want to say just a couple of other things before closing, closing um, which is that well, actually let me just say, well, let, me, let me just go full circle. Catherine has some, for some comments about the 2008 presidential election. Um, and what I would offer on that is the following. I, I have the uh, pleasure, I, I'm proud to be sort of a long time uh, Virginia resident, um, and I also had the pleasure of working in the last two Virginia governor's races, very involved in the Democratic Party. Um, and we, we had sort of an amazing thing happen in Virginia um, a year or so, a year ago, it was a year and a half ago now. Um, where we had basically a progressive liberal civil rights lawyer be elected to the government of Virginia. And so he got to be the governor of Virginia, uh, Tim Kaine. Now, a lot of people thought something like that could never happen. It happened for a couple of reasons. It happened because he was the lieutenant governor of a previous administration, uh, which was extremely popular for a governor that was more centrist. But, but I think it also happened because Tim um, acknowledged his faith as as part of, he wasn't a but Christian, he wasn't an and Christian. Uh, he acknowledged his faith as, a, as, a, as, as part of what motivated him to be in government. He acknowledged his faith uh, as part of what motivated him to do international development work um, as a young man. And I, I think there's a message in that, um, not just for Virginia, but for America, which is that I think there is an increasing level of comfort, at least people to acknowledge the role of faith in inspiring them to do what they want to do. And I think, I think if the candidates are comfortable with themselves as people, they will also, we will also see more of that in 2008. So I'll, I will just try to wrap it up for you. Thank you, these have been wonderful uh, presentations. And as the interviews, very different. Sometimes you ask the same question, you get a very, very different answer to them together. I think we're making a, a beautiful mosaic. Uh, we, uh, we're going to go just to 11.30. I suggest we take at least 15 minutes for questions, and then there'll be a 15-minute break. Uh, in other words, you'll have a little bit less time uh, for your coffee, but uh, I want to add. Now, first, let me ask if anyone on the panel has questions for each other. I do, but I, I think they get a lot of bad.
whatever kind of organizational issues that might create. Let's take a couple of questions. Um, so go next. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Larry Zaza. The history, I was one of the first public health specialists in the World Bank. For 10 and a half years, I led World Vision's Child Survival Projects with USAID. And now I have my own NGO, African Communities Against Malaria. And so as the funding begins to materialize in Africa for malaria, I'm attempting to close that gap between the donors, the governments and capital, and the communities who are supposedly the beneficiaries and recipients of NETS, medications, etc. It's, it's very challenging. One of the things I learned at the World Bank, you know, the, the, the expression, show me the money, my question is show me the disbursements. And that's a very hard issue to get at in terms of this malaria program, in terms of how much is actually going that route to get to the communities. I agree with David Beckman that this mapping exercise needs major updating. And um, what I see is that there's a huge facet of the whole development process that deals with communication that isn't even mentioned. This is all about UN organizations and World Bank and USAID that often strengthen the national governments, which are the major impediments in most of these countries I work in to the communities and the voices and the needs of, of those recipients to be actively engaged and stimulated. And so the, the issue is, on the contrary, there's a book called uh, I Can Hear You Now. It's about the um, Grameen Bank and the telecommunication industry. There, you see now all over Africa, you can buy scratch cards for telephones on every corner. Where did that come from? And, and I don't see anybody here talking about the financial capital markets that made that introduction of technology and the communication that then becomes the methodology for development in, in these populations that are usually uh, given lip service to and not truly serviced by the governments. Thank you. Any comments on that? So the question is for us for comments. Too short for this mic. I'm Melanie Kelser, I'm a professor at George Washington University, and I'm going to address my question to Tom Long, but maybe other people will speak to it too. Um, I do a lot of research on Christian organizations, but specifically evangelical organizations. Um, and I honestly, I'm asking this quite sincerely, I don't understand when people talk about this problem of the acknowledgement of faith-based organizations by our government. You know, I mean, obviously our president has um, acknowledged his religious beliefs. Our Secretary of State has uh, appeared on the cover of Christianity Today. Faith-based organizations are funded significantly, both domestically and internationally. Every presidential candidate is speaking in some fashion or another about their religious beliefs, I'm quite sure, over the next period of time. So I wonder, I sincerely don't know what people mean when they say that, and I hear it a lot, so I wonder if you can speak to that. Okay. Oh, one more. Thank you so much for this interesting discussion. My name is Shelton Davis. I, I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Latin American Studies. One of the things I wanted to ask about, the idea of having these faith-based organizations truly focuses on the idea of cultural diversity as well and spiritual diversity. And one of the major questions about development, especially that UNESCO and UNDP has raised, is the need to take into account cultural diversity in the promotion of development, especially under globalization. One of the things that, is, uh, that has happened here is that we've been fortunate to rejoin UNESCO that the Bush administration did, especially because of Laura Bush wanting to do that for education. But at the same time, we voted against cultural diversity's declarations. Uh, and what I'm wondering is, how much do the faith organizations here in the US want to promote cultural diversity with our new situation in UNESCO, uh, that cultural diversity should be a major thing that we should take into account in our development initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Well, why don't we start with Bill, since you got the first question, and then go to Javi and Steve. Okay, um, Grace, thank you for the question. And 
Um, there is a, what I'm going to say is a creative tension between advocacy and our programming work. And let me give you the blunt example that we are dealing with right now, which is the staff work. So there we are. We have a very large operation on the ground in West Star Fork that is providing assistance to um, 120,000, 200,000 people in their refugee camps, displaced people, displaced people in Chad. Um, we think we're providing life-saving assistance. Uh, but because we have, uh, because we're there and we're witnessing to the situation, we have a responsibility to try to address the root causes of those problems. However, because we're there, we also are subject to the vagaries and opinions of the local authorities uh, who read the New York Times, the Washington Post. And so if we were to make uh, certain protestations that, let's say, the Safe Darfur campaign does, we might find ourselves unable to provide the local assistance that we feel is life-saving. Um, believe me, that's a massive moral dilemma. That's something that we are uh, grappling with. You know, what is the appropriate role and the balance between providing basic, meeting basic needs and addressing the root causes? Because sometimes you can't do both, or you have to do both in a very creative way, uh, which is exactly what we want to do. Let me just comment very quickly on the um, the acknowledgement of faith and uh, that that Melanie mentioned, and whether that's uh, how we sort of see that issue. There's been more public acknowledgement of faith. I think that um, most of it, though, has been for cynical uh, political reasons to exploit, to, to appeal to voters. Uh, I and mean, I'm not going to drag out to critique the current administration, but I think uh, one, could, one could certainly argue that the uh, faith uh, connections policies uh, were, for at least a certain, uh, a certain percentage of it, uh, again, without impugning their motivation, but a certain percentage uh, may have been for overt political purposes. Now, that's a lot different than a real understanding in the development process and in society about how the basic nature of people as spiritual beings, as with basic needs, with rights and responsibilities that come from their very basic dignity, how that, uh, how those sorts of people should be treated, um, uh, coming from a perspective of faith. So I think that there's, uh, they may be doing better rhetorically, but on the non-rhetorical, actual understanding of the role of faith and faith organizations, I think there's a lot to be desired. And I would not underestimate how academics looking at development, how major donors looking at development, how international organizations looking at development have been for 50 years supporting governments to spend a lot of money while a quarter of the health care, half the health care has been provided by private faith-based organizations. It's kind of like now they're somehow getting that realization. Brilliant. Um, so finally, on cultural diversity, it's never been a problem for us. We have local Catholic presence in every single country. Uh, we're there doing a good job now. It's completely indigenous. Uh, if you want to succeed, good development requires that you are respective, uh, respectful of, fully cognizant of the dimensions of culture. And uh, again, that, that um, people are waking up to this now, uh, I think, is telling. Um, I'll just address the question that was addressed to me, and I'd like to build on the comments that were just made, um, and I agree with all of them. Um, and I would just like to add to that, I mean, in terms of um, when I'm making those remarks anyway, I'm making them um, based on my own experience, and acknowledge earlier that most of my political activities have been in the context of the Democratic Party. Um, you know, in spite of President and Secretary of State's acknowledgments, um, what I'm talking about is much deeper and much more intrinsic. Um, what I'm talking about is the fact that when I went to Princeton in graduate school um, and studied development and economics, 
there was no discussion of any in almost any of the classes except for one little bit and one little anthropology related class. Um, when I went to the World Bank and worked in development for three years, there was almost no discussion of faith at any stage of the process. And I was working on you know, health and education um, um, and environmental related issues. Um, Catherine Marshall can offer detail to this, but what year did you start the, the, the sort of world based outline? So in 1990, and from what I proposed, almost nothing before that. So it wasn't until 1999 that the bank actually got a, a staff person, or maybe two or three. And she can correct me um, if I'm wrong with the details. But you're talking about a 10,000 person organization that didn't have staff with being this issue. When you look at the National Security Council, when you look at the State Department, there's no, you know, there's no desk officer for, you know, that's really, that's charged with on a day-to-day -day basis looking at faith and looking at how faith inspires people in the process. Um, when I get to the president, and let me, let me just talk about it, that I can't speak to how Republican campaigns, I mean, it's not, I'm just sort of offering an off hand remark based on my personal experience. Having worked inside the last three Democratic presidential campaigns, um, what I can tell you is this, it wasn't until 2004 that the Democratic presidential campaign had a single staffer dealing with faith-based constituencies. We didn't have it in 2000, we didn't have it in 96, and as far as I know, we didn't have it for many years before that. I'm talking out of hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of staffers. So, yes, you can look at sort of a few examples and say, President of Knowledge, President Clinton, sort of church, whatever, but as, as a nation, we, we haven't been with this process. I, I just think we need to get a little more comfortable with this process. That's all. It's not, it wasn't in any way meant to critique this administration um, on, on, in that regard at all. Uh, but based on my, my little trajectory at Princeton, at the World Bank, with NGO, this presidential campaign, I just haven't seen it. And I haven't seen institutions that are comfortable with it. Um, and I'd like to see more of it. I think I'll answer a question that was not quite asked. But the question about the political concerns, it is interesting living outside the U.S. when political candidates make very overt kind of religious statements about their personal perspective, how that's picked up overseas. And my, my take would be that if you live in Asia, most of the people who are overtly pushing a religious agenda tend to be part of a pretty extreme party. And because most people in Asia have a big perspective, it would be unusual to not see the world through a faith lens. We, think we have this dichotomy in the U.S., but there's no such dichotomy in most of Asian people. That's just part and parcel of how you see the world. So when someone pushes that agenda, it tends to be a very extreme position. And the other experience with particularly American entities abroad, people who push a very religious perspective often tend to be groups who are really church planning, proselytizing, so when they hear that political debate, people pushing a religious perspective, it makes, it makes people very nervous as well. I don't think that was a question you asked. I thought I would share that. <coughs> the other has to do with the development and advocacy tension. Um, I think that we, it is a real struggle for groups that do development because some of the same funders are, are people who would be upset if you were on one side of things or the other, but particularly the government. So for us to work successfully in difficult places, we have to have the government believe that we are there um, and, and that we will do the right thing consistent with their policy. So I went to an NGO meeting one time and the Thai government said that you're all here working in Thailand. I'm sure you appreciate the Burmese border tension. I know that if you know of other organizations that are dealing with Burmese trafficking on the border, you, you would tell us that because you're an organization that would at all be involved in those kinds of things. So there's a very political agenda of working abroad. And I think the tension would best be described in this way, so there has to be a balance. So for instance, each year, there's a human rights report that gets published in every country. And housing falls under economic, social, cultural rights, CSC rights, as opposed to city political. There's almost nobody that ever writes on housing. So one of the things that we're looking at doing in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka doesn't even know how many people live in inadequate housing. So we could, be an author of a section on ESC rights saying the Sri Lankan government should know how many people live in inadequate housing. Well, that wouldn't endear us to the Sri Lankan government. However, we could go to the government and say, 
we're going to write this new rights annual report, but we are going to apply for funding, and with your support, we're going to help set up a program where you will know. So to give an issue and an answer seems to be where we've sort of wanted. I think it's, a, it's an awkward, it's an awkward situation. Well, we uh, are coming to the end of this first of two panels, uh, so I suggest that we take a deep break. Uh, I will not try now to uh, summarize uh, what has been, I think, a very far-ranging uh, and quite challenging discussion we've uh, clearly uh, been presented with the challenge of redefining what we mean by faith inspired faith. Uh, based organizations, particularly from the American perspective, but I think that would translate into organizations from any faith tradition in any country. This blend of political activism, lobbying, the uh, on the ground uh, operations uh, is, is something that's in the DNA, I think, of the organizations that we're talking about, and these firewalls that are clearly very difficult to find. So thank you all very much. There's coffee and other goodies outside, and we'll start again at 12.